Well, there was at least one wrestling match again on this past week's AEW program. Of course, it's not going to come as any surprise to anybody who was involved in that match, the fine members of FTR. Did you see the package that somebody in AEW, somebody in the production crew did? I don't think Dax and Cash did this themselves. It was sit-down interviews with Dax and Cash at their homes in the mountainous region of Western North Carolina where they talked about their friendship, their careers together as tag partners from the time they started training, blah, 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 and this match between the two of them to qualify for the Owen Hart tournament and how much it meant to them, how much the Hart family meant to them. It was about seven or eight minutes, and it made you not only want to see this match, but also this could have been, it could have been on Wide World of Sports. It could have been on ESPN. It didn't have to just be about a contrived and or choreographed sport. It could have been legitimate. They treated it seriously. It meant something to them. And they played that package. I saw it on Twitter. We got no on the television show that, good God, they could have taken this seven or eight minutes for this package instead of some of this other shit they foisted off on us and played that and it meant something. But instead because they have to keep their lead in from the Big Bang Theory. They put Cash and Dax on first with no package, no build, and right before they come out to make sure that the biggest star in the company is holding that Big Bang audience, here comes Lack Mussolini on play-by-play. Punk is from out of nowhere. I know he liked to watch the match, and he added to the presentation of it but now punk seg is his segment is seg one and they got to figure out a way to get punk out there brian where have we gone that a rerun of a 10 or 15 year old situation comedy not even in prime time but prime time adjacent 7 30 to 8 eastern does half again the ratings of a brand new first time ever show seen in prime time eight to ten and can tbs be happy that this program that they're paying for is underperforming a lead-in from a syndicated show that they buy for less money than they're given to aw you don't and know that are you serious? What is syndication prices these days for a Big Bang Theory package? Or what do they buy? Three runs or I'm however not many sure, runs? I got to think that's one of the biggest syndication packages out there today. But aren't they paying AEW tens of millions of dollars a year? How much do you think they pay to have the rights to a show like Seinfeld or The Office or Big Bang Theory? Goddamn, one would think that something that's already in the can and is being shopped around, being sold in syndication might be a little bit cheaper than something that's being produced from scratch and airing live. But, you know, it's kind of probably the same situation for the network because just like the Big Bang Theory, they're not paying for AEW's production. Tony Khan is. So in a lot of cases, it's the same kind of show. Everyone's been talking about the... But they're paying AEW, and everybody was talking about six figures or whatever the massive amount was. That was over the four years. It's still a lot of money. But Not six figures. However many figures it was. <laughs> six figures counting the cents. <laughs> anyway, it just uh, they just go into this match with a, a great package already in the can that, that built it and made it important. They could have even edited that down a bit and made it a little shorter. And, but instead they jump right in because as I said, they're underperforming their lead in in a prime time adjacency slot, which is not good. And they also lose, are they still losing people as they go along? Are they still heavier on the front end with the ratings? Maybe you can check that while I'm talking about this match. Yeah, but anyway, Punk did color. It did add some gravitas to the match. It's a qualifying match for the tournament, not even first round in the tournament. And it's Dax and Cash for the first time. And the announcers mentioned that they have teamed in just under 600 matches. And I'm like, shit, how long have they been a team? Because they were in NXT together in 2016, right? And they talked about teaming for almost 10 years. So... 
is that part of the problem now is that these guys are only getting 80 or 100 matches a year and have even before the pandemic and that's what that's why it takes so long for people to get experience when if you'd have said to me how many matches have FTR had together I would have thought, well, six, seven, eight years, you know, 1,000, 1,200, even with the modern schedule. Anyway. That's one of the big problems with wrestling. You just don't get opportunities to work. I mean, there are people, not even trainees, but there are AEW stars, people on that show, when if you really stop and look at how many matches they've worked in this year on TV, it's almost non-existent. Someone just told me that about, who was it? Was it Santana and Ortiz? That they actually haven't had any matches on TV for, like, months? I gotta actually check that, because we've seen them on TV. That's a difference. Yeah, they haven't had a tag match. Straight tag match. They've been in peripheries and multmans and things, but... Yeah. I don't... But I'm, going back to the Midnight Express scrapbook, um, either incarnation of the Midnight Express hit, hit 600 matches, counting TV tapings, in probably, what, 20 months? One would think. Anyway, from the time that these guys locked up, wrestling, flawless, whether running spots or mat wrestling or a little homage to Owen and Brett or exchanging holds, everything's sharp, everything's crisp, everything's perfect, the timing's in the right place. Then they worked a little spot where they were being physical with each other anyway, but Dax is pushing or... Yeah, Dax was pushing Cash back in the corner and accidentally poked him in the eye with a finger and temper flared. Cash got rough, shoved him. Then they started opening up with more spots. There was a nice superplex by Dax, and then he missed a diving headbutt. They go to the break. They come back. They're trading German suplexes. They hit that sweet double cross body in the middle of the ring. Both of them went down. Then they stood up and traded real forearms that you could hear the smack of the meat in the flesh and not the little flippy things to the side of the neck from guys that don't know how to throw punches. You know, they, they went through a series of roll-ups. They were trading the roll-ups. Then Dax hit that slingshot sit-out power bomb, got a nice two count. And they're in Philadelphia, which Punk pointed out. Philly, they love the Midnight Express and they love FTR. Thank you, Punk, for the shout-out. But that's true. Philadelphia was the original town for smart fans to be to become prominent, and they liked the guys that could go. It wasn't just about garbage wrestling. It wasn't just about ECW and barbed wire or street fights or whatever. The original smart fans in Philly recognized the talented guys and whoever they were, babyface or heels, and they liked them. And so you don't have to just feed the Philadelphia crowd garbage wrestling. They're more than that, if they were allowed to be. But everybody thinks when they go to Philadelphia, they have to pull out barbed wire like they did later on in the program for absolutely no good fucking reason. And I just turned around to see that it's a FedEx truck in my driveway. So I will <clears throat> I'll not get the gun and go down there. Um. Anyway, uh... Cash hit a great pile driver and got a two count. And I was, eh, I just hate a pile driver as a false finish, especially when they looked good. And the only other thing that I criticize about the match is both went to the, the deal where they go to the top rope and they're up there for too long. It's not realistic, but that was the only flaw. And then they did a nice back suplex, but Dax landed on top for a two count, little false finish. Boom, boom, boom. They took a bump through the ropes. Cash sold his knee big, and they beat the 10 count. And the people in Philly, again, they had chanted fight forever, which is somewhat ignorant and not what either competitor should want to do. But they chanted FTR. They were with the false finishes. And then as Cash had sold his knee from that fall on the outside, when they got back in, Dax goes for the sharpshooter and hesitates just for a minute because he doesn't want to hurt his partner's leg, which makes sense. Instead of this 
the conflicted shit. Should I bash this guy with a baseball bat even though he set my mother and her cat on fire last week? That's bullshit, but you might not want to hurt your friend. And then Cash took the opportunity to small package him, but Dax rolls it through and gets a one, two, three. And it was a nice, simple, easy finish that could have capitalized on a mistake that the other guy made. Nobody is really a clear winner or loser in this where one guy is clearly better, so they're still comparable as tag team partners. And when they shook hands and hugged afterwards, the sportsmanship was called for and made sense because they are partners and they had wrestled pretty much of a clean match where nobody was trying to injure a guy who's their partner and their livelihood depends on the other guy just because they're booked in a match. So again, now FTR has had the best match we ever saw in NXT for the best tag match, at least because Walter and Ilya Dragunov was in NXT. Also, they had the best match WrestleMania weekend on the ring of honor event with the Briscoes. They've had the best tag match we've ever seen in AEW a couple of times. And now they have a, you know, flawless singles match with each other. Was this singles match of the caliber of, you know, uh, a punk and MJF or Danielson's, you know, great main events? Possibly not. It wasn't built that way and it wasn't supposed to be that way, but it was flawless as a wrestling match. So <laughs> maybe Tony ought to have these guys booking and popping the corn. They can do everything else. What'd you think? I thought it was really good. I, you know, I couldn't get too much into it just because there was no good reason for these guys to be wrestling this match. I know they wanted to, and it's part of the tournament. There's no good reason this match should have happened. And quite frankly, the Philly crowd to me was the story because I think FTR having an FTR tag team match in Philly would have been amazing in front of that room. It would have, they would have, if they could have, my God, can you imagine what it was the, the Philly time. crowd would have done with the FTR and the Briscoes? Imagine what the Philly crowd would have done with FTR against anyone. It would have been a hot crowd for them the same way the Midnight Express comparison was true. I remember Halloween Havoc being there when Michael Hayes and Arn and Bobby Eaton came out and the place went crazy and the rest of the show sucked. <laughs> but that opening match was what they wanted. It was that kind of energy and FTR would have had it and it would have gotten over real big there as a tag team. They are over real big as a tag team. So, I mean, but it was a really good match. I thought Punk was excellent on commentary he always is the pre-match video i think that's one of the problems with aew they do these amazing packages leading up usually to pay-per-views and you don't see them and you don't see them i mean i know they air them like friday after rampage but i think they're more effective for selling the pay-per-views i think they're more effective for the storylines and even if you wanted to mix them into the show with live matches from an arena do it even the bucks who i'm not a fan of whenever i've seen the bucks featured in one of those package videos, it makes a little more sense why they behave the way they do. They're not acting completely goofy because of the nature of what kind of interview it is. Right. And right. everything they, else. I think they can't act they can't act like themselves in that setting. I saw it just like you did. I saw it on Twitter. And my first question was why? Why is this on Twitter? I see some of the things that get on TV and get past the commercial break on TV. If you can't put a three or four minute video that does something like this on TV, what are you doing? Well, they th everybody lives their life on the internet just because their base audience that they refuse to grow lives their life on the internet. And by the way, the, the reason why that the Bucks act the way they do ha has been explained previously. It's because of the lack of environmental regulations on nuclear waste in Southern California during the period of time of the decade that they were born. That's been established. That was in the uh, package to build up their match with Omega and Page, I believe. Yes, that's <laughs> yes. The, the nuclear waste segment that they did about <laughs> Cucamonga is swimming in green slime. Are they lizard people? They Well, they speak with forked tongues, so they very well be. It's a check. Somebody check underneath one of their wings and see if they're scaly. <laughs> 